every kid has a strong connection with his grandparents. Unfortunately, both of my grandfathers died before I was born. But I did get to meet one of my grandmothers. She was my mother's mom. I'm almost 32 now, and I can't remember a lot about her, but I heard some great things. Let me tell you about a story about me and my grandma. This one I remember as if it happened yesterday. I was 10 years old. I was not old enough to take care of myself if my parents left for work or something, so I needed a babysitter. That's when my grandma came into play. It was a winter day in January. I was still sleeping when I heard a lot of commotion around the house. I opened my eyes and I looked out the window. It was snowing and I was so happy. I mean, which kid doesn't love snow? I hopped out of bed, put on my slippers and rushed downstairs. I was excited. In my head, I was about to go to the backyard with my dad and build a snowman, but eventually I'd find out I'll be wrong. Good morning, honey, my mom said while looking for something in her purse. What's going on, I asked her while I was rubbing my eyes, still not being fully awake. Me and dad have to go out of town for the day, baby. It's a work thing, mom told me while still looking for something. What are you looking for, I asked her. My phone. I'm going to call grandma so she can come and stay with you tonight. You guys are going to have so much fun, she told me before taking the phone out of her bag. She then called her number before kissing me on the forehead and going into another room. Dad came in. He was dressed nicely and looked sharp. I was really hoping to make a snowman today, but hey, we'll do it tomorrow. How about that? Dad told me while smiling. I agreed and went in to hug him. He hugged me back. Anyway, Mom made me a bowl of cereal and told me that Grandma is on her way. Are you going to be okay today, honey? We really have to go, but Grandma will be here in about 10 minutes, Mom asked me. Of course, I'm going to be okay, I thought to myself. I was 10, not 5. They both kissed me and went out the door, and before they closed it, a couple of snowflakes came into the hallway from outside. They instantly melt, but I got a strong feeling of going outside and playing in the snow. Mom and Dad drove away, and even before I finished my cereal, Granny came in through the door. I was so happy to see her. I went over to her and gave her a big hug. We got along so well. After breakfast, we both went out into the backyard and made a couple of snowmen. One had a carrot for a nose and the other had a green cucumber. I found it quite odd, but we were all out of carrots. Grandma told me that this particular snowman with a green nose is special, just like me. I had freckles on my face and she always said that I was special. I got hungry from all that playing in the snow and she said that she would make me some pasta. I loved it. She would make it tastier than mom. I don't know what she put in it, but I'll never forget that pasta. After dinner, we played a game of Monopoly. It was the only board game we had in the house. I know Monopoly for two sounds pretty boring, but Grandma made it fun. She was magical through my 10-year-old eyes. As I was getting ready for bed and brushing my teeth, I took a look out the bathroom mirror. It started to snow really hard. It was a snowstorm, and as I glanced at the snowman we did earlier, all I could see were two piles of snow. Even the carrot and cucumbers were covered in it. Hello? Hello? I heard coming from downstairs. I brushed my teeth to see what was going on. My grandma was at the phone trying to call mom and dad. The phone lines are down due to the storm, grandma said. That's that. We'll see what we can do in the morning. Now off to bed. Come on, grandma told me as she walked me upstairs to my room. After giving me a goodnight kiss, she tucked me in. But I couldn't fall asleep. I was thirsty. So after about half an hour, I went downstairs to get myself a glass of water. Grandma was on the couch. What's wrong, honey? She asked me. I'm thirsty, Grandma, but why aren't you asleep yet? I inquired. She told me that she was right in the middle of a good book and couldn't put it down. She then started telling me about it. It was about a young lady born in a wealthy family, and that's all she told me, because the sound of the back door being opened interrupted her. Shh, go upstairs, now. Hide in your room and be quiet, my grandma told me. I tried to respond, but she put her hand over my mouth, covering it. Do what I say, she said, so I rushed upstairs. Grandma slowly went towards the back door. Hello, she said. Give me your money. Where's the money, a voice said. It was a young guy, couldn't have been over 20 years old. I was at the top of the stairs, looking at everything, staying in the dark. You can have it. Just let me get my purse, grandma said. Give me your watch, he said after seeing it on my grandma's wrist. It was the watch she had from her husband, and she couldn't give it to him. 
She refused, but the thief got angry and he approached her. He tried to grab her wrist, but she resisted. He hit her over the face with his hand in an attempt to scare her into giving him what he wants. But she stood her ground. She didn't even flinch. I believe the thief was a little scared of her as well. Give me the watch, he yelled while finally getting his hands on it. But my grandma poked him in the eye with her fingers. The thief backed off, so she grabbed the phone. I'm on with the police right now, she told him. The thief got scared and tried to run past her before the police came. Little did he know that the phone lines were down. But before reaching the back door, he hit my grandma in her stomach. She yelled in pain. He got out of the house, but she fell to her knees. He hit her really hard, taking into consideration that she was old. But eventually, she got up, locked the doors, and started to come up the stairs. While seeing that, I went to bed and I pretended I was asleep. Shortly after, she joined me, falling asleep next to me. The next morning, I heard the front door. I woke up and got out of bed. Grandma was still sleeping. I tiptoed out of the room so I wouldn't wake her. I told mom and dad everything and they went upstairs to check on her. The next thing I knew, I went to stay with my aunt for the day. I didn't know why, but eventually they told me Grandma died due to the blow she received from the thief. She suffered internal bleeding and died in her sleep. I'll never forget the night my grandma saved my life. Too scared to subscribe? <laughs> Ever since I was a kid, I'd spend time with rich people. My dad died when I was younger. I think I was about 10 years old. He was a very successful lawyer, and he was the reason we were wealthy, and we were part of an exclusive social scene. After my father's death, my mom recently remarried, but she didn't just marry anyone. She married the richest guy in Chicago. He was a billionaire, worth over $3 billion. I mean, we had money before. Our net worth was around $10 million. But to go from that to billionaire level was altogether different. Believe me when I say it's something completely different. We had money before, but nothing like this. And I just want to say that when you have that much money, you have some crazy hobbies as well. Crazy to the common folk, but to him, it was completely normal. I'll tell you about it soon. One day, we all went on a vacation. The destination was an exotic and extravagant place. I won't say the name, but it was really something crazy. Everything was amazing. It was just the three of us. Well, at least that's what I thought. But as soon as we landed at the airport, a car with two guys in it awaited him. He went ahead with them and me and my mom took a different car to the hotel. It seemed like he brought some of his crew with him. The next day while my mom was out doing her own thing, I believe she was at the spa or maybe she was getting a massage, I heard my stepdad talking with someone in his office. Yes, he had an office, even in a five-star resort. They were talking about going on a hunting trip they were discussing big prey and how they are clever and how they would need some sort of gun. I didn't quite understand everything they went on about. So being curious by nature, I opened the door to his study and I asked him if I could go with them. The two were surprised to see me. It was like they were hiding or something and I wasn't supposed to hear their conversation. Uh, well, well, you know, you're not experienced enough, my stepdad told me while smiling. Yeah, I know that, but maybe I could tag along and observe. How could I gain experience if I don't go hunting? I told him while smiling back to him. I knew I got him. You make a valid point, son. You really do. Tell you what, I'll promise you we'll go hunting when we get back home so that you can start with smaller prey and build up from that, he said while putting his hand on my shoulder. That sounds great, I told him. Then I left the office. I was pretty disappointed, but maybe he was right. Maybe the game was too large for me and he was just looking out for my safety. I guess I just had to wait until we got home so that I could go on my first hunting trip. Later in the day, I found out that they were going hunting on a nearby island. He told my mom that it was filled with boars and other wild and big animals. I spent the rest of the day by the pool and eating a lot of sweets, but I was still thinking about hunting. So in the morning, they took their guns and they got on a boat to go to the island he was talking about. I was really curious and I couldn't sleep all night. I had to see what it was like. Even though I wouldn't shoot anything, I would just observe. So, the next thing I did was pay a guy to take me to that particular island. He had a small and quiet boat. You couldn't really hear it. When I got there, I snuck around so that my dad wouldn't see me. 
I saw him, along with two other guys, preparing their rifles. They were inside some sort of modern hunting cabin. After they left, I went inside because I didn't want to stay under the trees surrounded by bugs and other animals without anything to protect myself. Inside, I saw that they had everything they needed, even a lot of TVs. So I went to the fridge, grabbed a Coke, and turned on the TV. But as I would soon find out, it was not just a TV. It was a monitor. They were all monitors. And I saw different parts of the island. While looking at it, I saw my dad with a friend of his. I thought it was cool to see him hunt, even though it was just on a monitor and I wasn't right there next to him. Soon I saw another man on the screen, but he didn't have a gun, and he seemed like he was running. And then I saw another, dressed in a t-shirt without any gear or gun, hiding behind a tree. I thought it was strange. Why would they be allowed to go hunting? Maybe they have a different role or something, I thought to myself. Soon after, I saw my dad coming from a bush right behind one of the guys. I got you now, I could hear my dad say. The cameras had microphones, but I didn't understand what he meant. There were no animals in sight. Slowly, I could see him raise his rifle and point it towards the guy's head. I could hear the man crying and begging my stepdad to stop, but he didn't flinch. The only thing he did was pull the trigger. I was speechless. The man was right there, dead on the ground, in a pool of his own blood. I looked at another monitor. I saw one of Dad's friends kill another person. After that, they were all cheering. They even put a foot on one guy's head. I went to the bathroom and I threw up. I, I couldn't stand it anymore. Then I saw they were coming back, so I rushed out of the cabin and headed towards the boat. The guy waited for me and he took me back to the resort. For the rest of the day, I stayed in my hotel room. I didn't want to eat. I didn't want to see anybody. Later that night, my dad came into the room and he asked me, What's wrong, son? Are you okay? I replied saying, Nothing's wrong. Then he told me and said, Exactly. He continued, I saw the coke in the cabin. I know you were there. You wouldn't understand why we were doing that. And this will remain between you and me, right? I don't want your mom to find out. Because it would be a shame if she came with me on a hunting trip and something went wrong. I understood that he was really dangerous. From that moment on, I never spoke a word about it. Even to this day, I wake up in the middle of the night in cold sweats, screaming at the top of my lungs. I know what you're thinking. They're not just regular night terrors. Oh no. Something happened to me when I was younger. More specifically, when I was about 13 years old. You know, the period in your life when you're curious and do the stupidest things. Since that day, I never had a decent night's sleep. And I'm almost 20 now. Seven years of sleepless nights and a constant feeling that something's going to get me each time the sun goes down or each time I'm alone in a room. You may wonder, what happened? Let me get right to it then. As I previously said, I was 13 years old. I grew up in a peaceful neighborhood, in the suburbs. You know, one of those streets that you can see in any movie. White picket fences, golden retrievers running everywhere, and helpful neighbors ready to give you a hand. I had a best friend called Maya. She was the same age as me and lived just a couple of houses down the block. We would play all day and spend time together constantly, at my house or at hers. Also, our parents were good friends. It seemed that everything was perfect. But soon, this little utopia was about to crumble and life as we knew it would change forever. Maya had a big brother. Some would consider him a bit of a troublemaker compared to every other kid on the block. But in hindsight, he also was a pretty good kid. He introduced the Ouija board into our lives. One summer day, when the scorching sun was merciless, me and Maya were hanging out in her room. We were dancing or something. Maybe we were playing dress up, something like that. I don't remember actually, but what I specifically remember was her brother. He barged into her room and started yelling. Where is it? He asked at the top of his lungs. Where is what? Maya responded, taking a step back. You know what? The Ouija board I brought home. It was under my bed and now it's gone. Where is it? Her brother asked again, appearing to get more and more angry. I don't know what you're talking about. Leave us alone or I'll call mom. Maya told him with authority. Her brother sighed and furiously slammed the door. Maya started laughing. I looked at her surprised. 
Why are you laughing? Did you do it? I asked her. Yeah, I took it. We'll play with it tonight. You're sleeping over, aren't you? We'll have a sleepover. What do you say? She asked me with a smile on her face. I had mixed feelings about her stealing that board from her brother, but I was curious on how it worked. Sure, I'm sleeping over, I replied with a smile. Why wouldn't I? I'd never seen something like it, and of course, I was curious. Anyway, the time passed. We had dinner, and finally, we retreated to her room. She reached under her bed and took out the Ouija board. Before putting it in the middle of the room, Maya locked the door from the inside. She had a key to her room, even though her parents didn't give it to her. But as she found her brother's property, she found the key. I didn't find that thing interesting at all. All I saw was a piece of wood with some letters on it and something round above them. How does it work? I asked Maya. Well, you talk to dead people with this thing. She responded. At that moment, my knees turned limp. D dead people? I repeated. Yes, come on, sit down. We'll put our hands on this round thing and ask a question. Then our hands will move on their own over each letter. She instructed me. I did just that, without asking any more questions. Maya first asked if there was any spirit in the room, and our hands moved, but I assumed it was her moving them over the letters. It said yes. She then asked if she will be famous, and the answer was again yes. Maya got so excited. She asked me if I have anything to say, but I said I didn't, so she proceeded to ask more questions. Will the entire town know me? She asked with excitement in her voice. The answer was again, yes. Then she asked her final question. The room is already dark, and before we began to use the Ouija board, she lit two candles on opposite sides of the room. Her final question was, how will I become famous? At that moment, the Ouija board started to shake. I knew it was her doing all of that. Stop it, I said while taking my hands off of it. I'm not doing anything, Maya responded while laughing. I got really scared. I started screaming and taking a few steps back from Maya. I never saw her like that. It was like she was a completely different person. Then I heard someone trying to get in the room. It was her dad. Are you girls okay? He asked while turning the doorknob. But the door was locked. I yelled, telling him that there is something going on. But Maya, well, she didn't say anything. She just stood there, looking at me. Slowly, she started walking towards me, but all of a sudden, she looked right at her bed. What are you doing? I asked her. Without saying anything, she took out a big knife from under the bed. I froze. I screamed and told her to stop it. Then I grabbed her hand, but she put the cold blade on my arm and started pressing. She also grabbed my arm, stopping me from escaping. I was crying and begging her to stop while the knife went into my arm. Blood started dripping from my hand and I didn't know what to do. She kept pressing it harder and harder while at the same time looking me in the eyes. She was insane. I really thought I was going to die right then and there. She wouldn't listen to me. It seemed like she wasn't phased by my constant screaming and the blood dripping on the floor and on her shoes. Finally, her dad managed to bust through the door. Maya, stop! He yelled, before quickly taking the knife from the hand. He then saw me and called an ambulance. I went to the hospital and the doctor managed to make me as good as new. Obviously, my mom wouldn't let me be friends with Maya anymore. And later, as I grew up, my mom told me that she knew Maya had some sort of problem and was on pills. But she always assumed she had ADHD or something. I never saw my friends since that day but I'll always remember her and that sleepover when I look at the scar on my forearm. Too scared to subscribe? <laughs> Trick or treat. There was a loud banging on my door after the words. I rolled my eyes and stayed seated, hoping whoever was at the door would go away. Trick or treat, the person yelled again, infuriating me. I grabbed the water gun from my room and went to open the door. It was a little boy dressed in the worst butterfly costume I had ever seen. I sprayed water on him and he ran away, crying and screaming. I felt accomplished and shut my door with a silly smile. I was 24 and lived by myself in the city. I hated holidays, Halloween especially. 
I just didn't see the point. People got dressed in silly costumes for a day to celebrate what? It was pointless to me. I was content staying at home watching Netflix. There was another knock on the door. I cursed under my breath. Why would these people not leave me alone? The knock came again, urgently. I picked my water gun up and went to open the door. I didn't get to see who was at the door because immediately as I opened it, the person rushed past me, making me lose my grip on the water gun. I frowned and I turned to yell at the person. Shh, you have to help me, please. It was a woman and she looked like she'd been crying. Her hair was a mess and her eyes were wide and frightened. She looked like she was in trouble. I groaned inwardly. I was a quiet guy and hardly talked to my neighbors. I didn't want any drama. Look, I don't know you. Whatever's going on with you is, is none of my business. I liked my solitary life and I didn't want any complications. This woman looked like a complication. She broke down in tears, explaining to me that she was running from her husband. He was abusive and would beat her up from time to time. She said that he got violent again and she got scared for her life, so she had to run away. It was then I noticed she was holding her left arm gingerly. After seeing my stare, she explained that he pushed her down the stairs and she landed on her arm, spraining it. I sighed and went over to get her some ice. She sat down on my sofa and I wrapped ice in a towel before handing it over to her. This is still none of my business. You have to go to the police. She shook her head violently. He'll kill me if I ever report him. I proceeded to tell her that it was an empty threat and there was nothing he could do behind bars. I told her she was too young to spend her life in torture. She looked to be in her late 20s. I know you're inside, Susan. We both froze and she whimpered, dropping the ice. Her husband had found her. I was torn. I didn't know whether to hide her or just dump her outside. My door just got kicked open and then Susan and I rushed over to our feet, looking towards the door. A huge man walked in. He pointed at Susan and ordered her to follow him. She stubbornly refused and moved behind me. Her breasts were shaky and I swore I could hear her heart beating faster. This man looked at me with eyes full of rage. I raised my hands and I told him to calm down. He was a really big guy and I was sure he would put me down if given the chance. So it's you who has made her this confident. I opened my mouth in shock, explaining that I'd just met her for the first time and had no idea who she was. He shook his head disbelievingly and told Susan to follow him again. As she stayed where she was, he walked towards us and I tried to walk away from his path. Susan's hand clutched my shirt and prevented me from moving. I knew he'd probably hit her when he got her back and I got angry. Some people were sadists. She isn't your property. You can't just order her around. The man paused. What did you say? I swallowed at the look of his face and heard a commotion at my front door. About two kids were standing on my porch, each of them in costumes. They were little, couldn't be more than 10 years. They clapped their hands together, looking entertained. They thought we were putting on a show. In the time I was distracted, Susan's husband had closed in on us. He punched me in the stomach and I grunted, <clears throat> bending over in pain. Oh. I drove my shoulder into his middle, but couldn't manage to make him fall down. He brought up his hands and banged me on my back. My breath left me in a whoosh and I fell down wheezing. Call the cops, I yelled at Susan. She was trembling and I felt sorry for her. If this was the kind of torture she experienced, no wonder she was such a mess. He kicked me and the kids outside started cheering at Susan's husband, like it was a no holds barred WWE match going on. I lay on the floor trying to recover from the blows. I wanted to call the police, but my phone was out of my reach. I heard a scream and looked up. Susan was being yanked by her hair and her husband sneered in her face. The kids paused the cheering. Now they were starting to look scared. This is real, get help, quick. Their tiny feet ran down my porch and I wish they found help soon. Susan's husband dragged her by the hair and was talking to her outside. I stood up, still huffing, and my eyes fell on the water gun. Call it a reflex or my stupidity. I sprayed water on his back. He looked at me and raged like a monster. He ran towards me, leaving Susan. Susan fell down and held her head crying. I sprayed him in his eyes and he yelled as the water disturbed his vision. I kicked him between the legs and he went down, <clears throat> face contorted in pain. <clears throat> I heard footsteps out of my house and I looked up. A small and heavy man rushed in and surveyed the situation. 
Behind them were the children that I asked to get help. I looked at them with utter disappointment. This is what they brought me? To my surprise, this man sat on Susan's husband and he was unable to move. I sighed in relief. I called the police and they arrived soon. After calming Susan down, she narrated everything she had been through with her husband and promised to testify against him in court. I was given analgesic for the pain I felt and also told to get enough rest. Susan joined a support group for abused women and they helped her get over her ordeal. I checked on her from time to time. My experience made me despise Halloween even more, but also changed me a bit. I started a blog and channeled it towards helping people who needed help to voice out before it was too late. The snow continued to increase, making it harder to drive. I kept pushing the car. It was at least 30 minutes before I got to my destination, the college campus. It was getting harder to drive, but I had no choice. To make it to my early morning class tomorrow, I had to sleep at the campus. As I drove further, I noticed two figures standing at the side of the road. When I got closer, I saw a man and a woman sitting in a car. By the look of things, they might have had issues with their car, which was also parked at the side of the road. There were some tools lying near their car. It was a good thing to be nice, but in this situation, stopping in the snow to offer some people whom I didn't know a ride seemed a bit off. However, they looked really miserable, so I decided to help them. I asked if I could help them, and the girl moved to the passenger side of the car to see my face. Yes, please. We've been stranded here for several minutes now. You are a godsend. Thank you so much, the girl replied. As I was driving, the guy thanked me too. He said his car just broke down for no reason, but he had called a tow truck to get it to the garage. His name was Tyler, and the girl was Riley. I asked where they were headed, hoping it was going to be in the same direction. Towards Avenue Street number 5, Riley said. It was a slight detour from the campus, but I told them I would drop them off first. Yes, thank you, Tyler said. While I was driving, Riley kept on staring at me from the rearview mirror. She gave me a suggestive smile. I found it a bit odd and tried to focus my attention towards the road. After about 15 minutes, we arrived at their house. Just as they were about to step out of the car, the snowstorm got really bad. It was bad to the extent that it was going to be difficult to drive. You could relax a bit and it's not safe to drive in such weather. Tyler looked concerned. I expressed my gratitude as I took my phone keys and jacket out of the car with me. The house felt cozy and warm once I stepped in. It was way better than the weather outside and I was very glad for that. I sat on the sofa making myself comfortable. Tyler excused himself and went upstairs, muttering that he had a long night of office calls ahead. Riley, too, left to freshen up. I hope you would like some coffee and some cookies, she asked before leaving. I nodded. As I was sitting alone, I brought out my phone to text my roommate. He was someone who would get worried easily, and I didn't want him to be unnecessarily worried about me. Hey! A soft voice called out to me. My jaw dropped as I looked up from my phone to see Riley standing in front of me wearing nothing but a small towel. I looked around to make sure I was still in the right place. How did this happen so fast? I smiled and looked away from her. I tried to ignore her. It is her house, and she can wear whatever she wants, I thought. My conscience was clear for a while after saying that to myself, up until when she started coming closer. What are you doing? I asked politely. It was starting to piss me off, but I was in her house and that required that I give her some respect. It was hard not to shove her away though. Funny that she didn't seem to remember that her boyfriend was in the same house with us. Come on, we could all have fun. The more the merrier, right? You, me, and Tyler. He loves when people join us. I'm sure you want it too, said Riley, as she slowly removed her towel. She stood there in front of me, all naked, with her arms still holding the sides of the towel. I asked if her boyfriend knew what she was doing, hoping that it would be enough to scare her away. She didn't back off an inch. It was getting extremely difficult for me to ignore her. Come on, you wouldn't love a little bit of fun with a stranger? Riley said the stranger in a high-pitched voice like that would get me interested. I was losing it, but I needed to be calm. The word respect kept playing in my head. I politely told her to wear something. 
Riley! The voice must have been enough to get her scared as she covered herself back. Tyler! She broke down in fake tears and said I tried to force myself on her. She was lost in fake hysteria, telling Tyler that I overpowered her and tricked her. How in the world could someone be such a good liar and actor? Before I realized what was happening, I felt loads of blood leaving my cheek at once. Seconds after, I realized I had just been punched very hard. I held my hands out, trying to stop Tyler's attack. I started to tell him that she was the one who came to me, but I had not completed my statement before I felt small fingers hitting my cheek very hard. She slapped me. I was in shock. First, she went against me, and then she had the guts to slap me. I remained staring at her in shock. I got very angry, but decided to watch the drama that was going to unfold as I noticed Tyler walking towards Riley angrily. You have the guts to cheat on me and still lie about it? Oh, he forced you to prance around on the towel like that? Do you know how long I've been watching you and I heard the conversation if you didn't think I didn't? Tyler said, his fists clenched. He really knew it was his girl's fault and still beat me up? I wondered if I was in the twilight zone. Tyler looked at me apologetically and told me sorry. He said he needed to release the anger he felt and he couldn't hit his girl. He had to hit me instead. I couldn't believe my ears. I grabbed my things and rushed back to my car, shaking my head. That was enough drama for one day. I should have never stopped to pick them up. I should have pretended not to see them. Thankfully, the snowstorm reduced and it was better to drive. I drove back to my campus angrily. I'm never going to be nice again. Too scared to subscribe? <laughs> we all love holidays. I mean, what's not to love? My mom, for example, loves Christmas. It's her favorite time of year. Every single time, she would surprise us by decorating the entire house with lights and all sorts of things. One year, she even decorated my room while I was sleeping in it. This is how passionate she is about Christmas. My dad, on the other hand, likes basketball season. He also likes the Super Bowl. I mean, these are his holidays of choice. Pretty weird, I know, but who am I to judge? But what about me? Well, I inherited the love of holidays from my mom, especially a particular one. I know what you're thinking, and it's not Christmas. Oh no, I'm a big, big fan of Halloween. Ever since I could remember, it's been my favorite holiday. I would love to dress up as different characters throughout the year. Of course, being a little girl, I would dress up like a princess, but as I got older, my costumes got darker, as I, as expected after all. But there's one particular year. That year changed everything. I got a new perspective and I started seeing Halloween as, well, different. I started seeing it as something that could be dangerous and I always had one eye open ever since. Let me go back about five years. That's when it happened. It was October 30th, one day until Halloween. I was still living with my parents at the time in a cute house in the suburbs, way nicer than the one bedroom apartment I live in now, but I digress. So as I was saying, I was quite young and living with my mom and dad. That particular year, I don't know why, but dad wanted to set up the decorations. I guess mom was busy and he just wanted to help out. I don't know. So he came into my room that afternoon. Jess, he screamed. I got startled. What? I had my headphones on. Or are those too small for you to see? I snarked before laughing. Come on, let's set up the Halloween decorations, he told me. I was surprised, but excited at the same time. Yeah, I'll come down in a sec, I told him before he closed the door. When I got downstairs, he was already looking through the boxes. Where's mom? I asked him while looking around the living room. She's at work. She just got a phone call about a patient or something. My dad responded without taking his eyes off the fake spider web and plastic skulls. My mom was a psychiatrist and still is. She works with all kinds of people, but unfortunately, I couldn't hear any of her stories. You know, doctor-patient confidentiality. But I bet they got pretty interesting. Moving on. Me and my dad were setting up the decorations, and it only took us about two hours. Done, he said with a smile on his face while proudly looking at what he managed to do. To be honest, mom used to decorate the house and front yard way better, but being his first try, I can say he did an okay job. As we were heading inside to clean ourselves off, a car pulled up in the driveway. It was mom. 
I remained behind to greet her, but she didn't get out of the car. I waited a few seconds to see what she was up to, but she just stayed there. I could see her from the living room window. She wasn't on her phone or anything. She was just sitting in her car, looking in front of her. Something didn't look right, so I decided to go out and see if she was okay. Mom? I asked while knocking on her car window. She got startled and looked at me for a second with her big eyes. She then seemed to be snapping out of the state that she was in. After that, she proceeded to take off her seatbelt, but instead of getting out, she looked into the back seat for something. Mom, is everything okay? I asked her. Yeah, I'm fine. I'm just looking for some papers for work. It's about a patient of mine. After she found the papers, we went inside. Dad was already on the couch watching the game. Me and Mom went to the kitchen. She still had a worried look on her face, but she wasn't going to tell me what went on at the office. Dad came into the kitchen as well. He kissed her and asked her what was going on, but before saying anything, she looked at me and then changed the subject. Anyway, that evening went on as usual. We ate, we made a little chit chat, and then I went to bed. I was so excited that tomorrow was Halloween, but I was kind of worried about mom. Something went on that day and she didn't tell me what. It was around 1 a.m. and I couldn't sleep, so I got out of bed to go to the kitchen and get some water. As I came out of my room, I heard something. My mom and dad were awake. It was strange because usually they were asleep at this hour. But they were talking about something and I couldn't understand, so I went closer to the door. They were talking about what happened at work. I didn't catch the entire conversation, but I heard a patient of hers escape the institute and the police were looking for him. He was supposed to be a violent individual who was declared mentally unstable. After they stopped talking, I got a drink of water and then went to bed. The next day went by so fast that I didn't remember what went on. I was a little too old to go trick-or-treating, so I met up with some friends and we walked around town. As we passed by a park, we heard something. We looked in the direction of the park but saw that it was empty. Only a street lamp with a dying light bulb was making it possible to see anything. We must be imagining things, I told my friend, and we wanted to keep walking. But then we heard something again. It was someone whistling. Hello, I said while wanting to go over there. But my friend Abby grabbed me. Are you crazy? Don't go there, she said. While we were talking, something came running towards us from a bush. It was a man all dressed in white. We all started running, but he managed to grab Abby and they both fell to the ground and all of my friends were gone. I was the only one who didn't leave Abby behind. I started screaming and calling for anyone, but there wasn't anyone around. Abby was struggling to get the man off of her. The guy was small, probably smaller than my friend, but he was strong. He finally pinned her hands to the ground and started laughing. In a moment of despair, I grabbed a rock from the ground and came up from behind him, hitting him on the back of the head. The guy wouldn't stop laughing. He didn't even flinch, so I hit him again. But this time, he turned around and slapped me across my face, making me lose my balance. I fell to the ground. The guy got up and started to come towards me. I got up, still holding the rock. He was laughing the entire time, even though the back of his head started to bleed from the blow. As he was walking slowly towards me, Abby started screaming. Leave her alone, she said. But the guy didn't seem to hear. He seemed so focused on me, maybe because I hit him in the head with a rock. Finally, the guy got his hands on me. He was squeezing my hands so hard that I dropped the rock. While this was going on, Abby was calling the cops. She couldn't do anything else. I tried to hit the guy with my feet, but he didn't seem to feel pain. He was just standing there, holding my arms above my head and looking into my eyes while laughing. Finally, I could hear police sirens. He didn't seem to be bothered by them. The police officers told him to let me go, so he finally did. He turned around and started laughing even harder, staring one of them in the eye. Then, out of nowhere, he started running towards him, trying to attack him, but one of his colleagues managed to tase the guy. Me and Abby got home. I told my mom what happened and she started crying. That was her patient, the guy she was supposed to cure, the one who escaped from the institute. This is going to be your stepmom, Julia. Sasha, meet Julia, my daughter. My dad said. I looked at him surprised, then I looked at Sasha. She looked young under all the makeup, but I knew she was around 30 years old. 
My dad told me that he has been seeing someone for a while now, but I never knew it was serious. At 20, I knew I didn't need a mother like other kids would since I was all grown up. My dad looked happy though, smiling at Sasha like I wasn't in front of them. I extended my hand for a handshake, but Sasha pulled me in for a hug. Her perfume clouded my nostrils. We're going to be best buddies, Julia, she said, her voice sounding so high-pitched. I winced and smiled back. I told my dad I was happy for him and welcomed Julia to the family. She moved in with us barely two weeks later. They had a court wedding the week before and went on a honeymoon in Rio. My dad stayed at home for one more week, saying that he was his own boss and deserved time with his new wife. I thought Sasha liked my dad though. I didn't think she liked me. She would laugh at my dad's boring jokes and find a reason to constantly touch him. If I was with them, her smile would seem a little forced and it appeared like she was trying to show my dad she wanted to be on good terms with me. My dad trusted her a lot and was head over heels in love with her. My dad went back to work, his own company, and it made me apprehensive that it would be just me and Sasha at home. I stayed in my room, refusing to come out and force a conversation. I wasn't prepared for it. There was a knock on my door. I opened the door for her and asked her if she needed anything. Her arms were crossed and she was looking at me with distaste in her expression. How old are you, Julia? She asked. I was frowning when I told her that I was 20 years old, wondering where the conversation was going. Don't you think you should have moved out of your father's house by now? I stared at her for a few seconds as I replayed what she said in my head. Was she chasing me out of my own father's house? Before I could reply, she told me that she understood that I wanted to stay with my dad so I could take care of him and reduce his loneliness. She said that she was with him now and there was no need for me to remain with him. He has me as his wife now. You're no longer needed, she emphasized. Her words were hurtful, but I refused to let her see it. I smiled and told her I'd hurt her. I knew I couldn't tell my dad. He would either not believe me or worse, take her side. It was something I had to deal with on my own. We had two cars, mine and dad's. Sasha complained to my dad that she needed my car so she could move in the city without stress. My dad asked me to give her the keys, promising to get me another car soon. Sasha looked at me with a smug smile and I felt crushed within. I started to take the bus to college and it was a downgrade from how I used to go to school. I told myself that I could cope with it and put on my brave face. I've made Sasha a shareholder in the company, my dad said over dinner. I swallowed the mouthful of spaghetti and asked, what? I refused to look at Sasha because I knew she would have a triumphant look on her face. Yes, my darling. My dad reached over and squeezed Sasha's hand. She now owns 15%. 15% was a lot in my dad's company, just a little lower than my 20%. I looked at my dad's happy face and forced out a smile. I went downstairs to the laundry room to wash my clothes that I dropped there the night before. I eyed a basket of pale yellow clothes, thinking it looked like it contained my clothes. Upon going through it, I realized they were my clothes. Someone had washed my clothes without separating the colors. A yellow sweater had been washed with the whites and I knew it was deliberate. I marched upstairs to confront Sasha. She had an evil smile on her face as she told me that it was unintentional. I had to try to keep my anger in check. She was obviously lying, but I couldn't do anything about it. The next day, I found out that all my favorite cereals had been thrown out. Sasha claimed that they were all expired. We both knew they weren't, but my dad believed her completely. What broke my resolve not to get frustrated was when I discovered that I got blocked from my dad's data plan. I had an assignment to submit and I needed an internet connection desperately. I had to haul a cab back to school so I could use Wi-Fi. 
I got home around 8 in the evening, drained. I planned to just crash on my bed and go to sleep. When I got to my room, I had to rub my eyes because I couldn't believe what I was seeing. All my clothes were strewn on the floor, my bed, and some were hanging crookedly off the hangers. Even my underwear wasn't spared. My shoes were off the rack and were lying around. That bitch! I cursed. The following day, I searched for an apartment and told my dad I was moving out. He was sad, but I told him I was more than ready to stay on my own. The smile Sasha gave me as I left tempted me to punch it off her face, but I restrained myself. I pitied my dad because I was sure Sasha wasn't with him because she loved him. I couldn't do anything but watch from a distance because my dad was too emotionally dependent on her. I would visit my dad once in a while and preferred it when we went out just the two of us. A few months went by. We were supposed to go to Fort, a classy restaurant downtown, and I looked forward to it. When I got inside, I saw my dad sitting at one of the back tables, his head in his hands. Dad, what's wrong? I asked as I sat down. That bitch, Sasha. She left me. She took your car. Documents of one of the properties I transferred to her name. She sold off her shares at my company and ran off with the money. My dad closed his eyes, swallowing hard. I wasn't surprised, but I felt angry. Angry at Sasha. Angry at my dad for being too stupid in love to see Sasha for who she was. I was also angry at myself, because I thought there was nothing I could have done to prevent this from happening. As I consoled my dad, I swore to myself that I would find Sasha. I would make her pay. Too scared to subscribe? <laughs> I walked over to the room to get what they were saying clearly, and when I had an idea of what it was about, I feared for myself, for my friend, Noah, and for his sister, Belle. Earlier that day, Noah and I planned a sleepover at his place. My mom was reluctant at first, saying that we were just 11 years old, but I managed to convince her. I was very happy seeing Noah, even if I saw him the day before at school. He was the closest thing I had to a sibling, and spending time with him would not be a bad idea. We had so many activities planned. Painting, we both loved to paint. While Noah would love to paint toy cars, I would go with painting flowers and teddy bears. We were different, but the same. It was still painting after all. After painting, we ran around the house, spilling water on each other from the water guns, and only moved to continue the fun outside when his mom complained about messing the house up. It was not our fault. Boys just love their fun. When we got tired of running, coupled with the pain in our legs from the stress of running, we went inside to watch some TV shows. We immediately turned on Nickelodeon. It had some of the best shows any child would want. Night came faster than I thought, and when I turned to Noah to ask where we were going to sleep, he was fast asleep on the chair, his hair already all over the place from just a few minutes of sleep. He was a messy person in a fun way, both awake and sleep. He was very simple, which made spending time with him much easier. After a few minutes, boredom came over me and I slowly sank deeper into the chair as sleep suddenly came over me. When I opened my eyes, I was on a very comfortable bed, Noah still fast asleep beside me. His mom must have brought us to the bedroom after we fell asleep in the sitting room. My throat felt dry for some reason and I got out of bed to get a glass of water to help quench my thirst. Just as I was about to descend the stairs to get into the kitchen, I heard some whispers and someone crying. It was hard to know who, but it was probably Belle, Noah's elder sister. I moved closer to where the sounds came from, Belle's room, which was just a few steps from Noah's. I stood at the side of the door, keeping it silent like my life depended on it. You have to do it. I need this promotion. A guy's voice said, his back was turned to the door, and I couldn't decide if I knew the person. His voice was very familiar, but because I could not see his face, I didn't try to judge by the voice alone. 
I can't. What if mom finds out about it? Belle said, her eyes puffy and red from all the tears. You're 18, Belle. You're not supposed to be scared of your mom anymore. You should be able to make decisions on your own. The guy said again, anger and frustration evident in his voice. Okay, what if she finds out, Dad? Dad? Did she just call the guy sitting in front of her dad? How? She's not going to find out. Tell her that you want me to sleep with your boss just so you can be promoted, Belle said, emphasis on the own and you. You know I can't do that, the guy, her dad, said. I ran as fast as my legs could take me. I jumped on the bed as soon as I got back to Noah's room, pretending to fall asleep. I guess they heard the running and the slamming of the door because they, Belle and her dad, came into the room to check who might have heard their conversation. But fortunately for me and unfortunately for them, there were two boys in the room, both deeply asleep. I waited patiently for morning to come and even after that, I had to wait for my mom to pick me up which I instantly regretted because I had to see their faces this morning before going for my breakfast, which Noah's mom made compulsory. I ate silently while Noah tried to force me to play with his food like he was doing to his, but if he only knew what was going on in his house. I felt so wrong to say it out loud to anyone, so I just kept it to myself, waiting for my mom in silence. I was only 11 years of age, but I knew it was wrong totally wrong for something like that to happen. I watched Noah take his eyes away from me sadly when I refused to play with him. It was not my fault. Something bad was happening and I couldn't tell him about it. I wanted to, but if he didn't believe me, it would only seem like I was lying. Jason? I heard Noah call out my name. Yeah? Can I talk to you in my room? He asked casually. Sure. We walked quietly, not saying a word to each other, till we got upstairs. Why won't you talk to me? Did I hit you when I was asleep? Mom says I do have bad sleeping positions and that I get messy in my sleep. I'm really sorry if I did anything bad. You're my friend and I don't want you to stop talking to me. He went on and on. You didn't do anything bad. I just saw and heard something bad and I didn't know how to tell you. I started slowly, thinking of ways to say it. What is that? His eyes lit up, a look of curiosity in them. Your sister and dad. Your dad wants her to sleep with his boss. He says it's for his promotion. He was really arguing about it, I said. Oh, that? It's okay. Mom goes out with men too. Men from her office. Is there something wrong with it? Anything wrong? Many things were wrong, or not. That was the last time I went over to Noah's place. I told my mom and she encouraged Belle to report to the police. Her father was arrested and charged to court. Even though I thought I did the right thing, Noah never spoke to me again. I listened to my mother's lecture with a frown on my face. She was reminding me that I was supposed to eat healthy all the time. She continually tells me that junk food is bad for me and has really bad consequences. I was the only child and we were a happy family of three before my dad died. Ever since my dad died, she has been so particular about what we eat. My dad was working at a business firm that demanded a lot from him. He always used to complain about how stressful his job was. He started to eat a lot of junk food and drank alcohol because he claimed that it was a stress reliever. My dad died a few months ago and the autopsy said the things he was consuming destroyed his liver and there was no way he could recover from it. My mom went into shock and had to go for therapy. Those few weeks were very tough for me. I had to grieve my dad and also watch my mom spiral down a rabbit hole of despair. She was 37 years old and she hardly took care of herself. Anna, are you listening to me? My mom asked. I jerked out of my reverie and looked at her. 
You're just 16. You can't afford to make the mistakes your father made. I nodded. What else could I do? After her lecture, my mom threw out all the junk food and warned me not to order any takeout. Everything in our fridge was either veggies, fruits, or grains. She consulted a nutritionist that gave her a diet plan and the kind of food we can eat. I was taking it slowly. The reality had not yet dawned on me. The next day, I was craving pizza and ordered it immediately. It got delivered and I went to pay for it. I was eating the last slice in the living room when my mom came home. I froze mid-bite and watched as my mom's face got red with anger. She took a deep breath and dropped her bag on the floor. I shot up from the couch and started to tell her that I was sorry and that it would never happen again. With tears in her eyes, she told me she didn't want to lose me too. Throughout the coming weeks, she monitored me a lot. She would spy on me even when I went out on dates with my boyfriend. My mom made life hell for me. I felt so suffocated and unhappy. My boyfriend, Mark, was getting tired of all her antics. I can't keep seeing you if your mom is always going to be on the lookout for whether you eat healthy or not. I sighed in frustration. Mark had been patient enough. The last time we went to the movies, Mark bought popcorn. Even though I tried to resist the urge to eat it, I found my fingers going inside the bowl. The next thing was that I received a smack on my head. Mark and I looked back only to see my mom in the seat behind us. I told Mark that I understood and we decided not to go out anymore. I was in chains. I struggled with all my might but I couldn't get free. A huge donut rolled up to me and my stomach rumbled. I was very hungry. The donut rolled away from me followed by different junk food, pizza, cake, and pies. I groaned, yanking my chains. Then a huge broccoli hopped to me, rubbing itself on me. I screamed as other veggies joined in and tried to smother me. In front of me was a mirror. My reflection started to eat the veggies, ravenous. I watched in horror as my reflection shrunk in size and my hair started to fall out. My scream woke me up. I made a decision then. I was going to eat what I wanted to eat. I won't end up like I did in my nightmares. In school, I bought some donuts and ate them in the bathroom. When I felt guilty that I disobeyed my mother, I told myself that I would just eat a little that wouldn't even matter. It looked like I had found the perfect solution to my predicament. I thought that the junk food would make me increase in size and weight, so I started to cut back on what I ate. I would eat just once a day and sometimes not eat throughout the whole day. I continued to eat all the junk food I wasn't allowed to and would throw them up almost immediately. My mom noticed that I was getting really thin and she complained to her nutritionist. When she talked to me, I told her I was eating everything my mom provided and nothing more. I told myself that I was really not eating those junk foods if I ate them in little quantities. The next day after school, I went to my room and started to eat the pie I bought. My mom would be home soon, so I rushed to finish the pie. When I was done, I walked to my bathroom and leaned over the toilet bowl. Sounds of retching filled my room. I shoved my fingers deep inside my throat and vomited the pie. I rinsed my mouth and my face. When I turned back to go to my room, I saw my mom standing in the doorway with tears streaming down her face. I froze and wanted to tell her that I could explain but as I opened my mouth to talk, the words escaped me. I fell down to the floor and cried, covering my face with my hands. I'm sorry, I sobbed. It's so hard, mom, I can't do it. My mom was crying and she came to hug me on the floor. Oh, Anna, I'm really sorry. I didn't know this would happen. I just didn't want to lose you too. After we cried for a while, my mom ordered pizza and told me I could eat it without any fear or guilt. We ate it together and I had to control the urge to run to my bathroom to throw it up. My mom started to buy the junk food she denied us of and took us off the diet. She stopped monitoring me and let me eat out. Sometimes I still had nightmares and would wake up screaming. Once in a while, I couldn't resist the urge to force myself to throw up. 
When I told my mom, she took me to a psychologist for therapy and I was diagnosed with anorexia nervosa. I had to go for therapy sessions once every two weeks. My mom had to go for therapy too. She blames herself for what happened to me and fell into depression. Little by little, my mom realized that she couldn't have controlled what happened to my dad and that she should forgive herself for almost ruining my life. I supported her growth and was happy when she started seeing someone else. The damage was already done to me, and I could only hope that I got better. The high-pitched sound of the siren was what woke me up from my sleep. I looked outside my window to see police officers pointing guns at our entrance. They looked so ready to take down whoever was going to walk out the door. They yelled at us to come out, but I watched as my father crept and locked the door. I looked as I tried to understand what was going on. My parents were acting like criminals. What could he have done? He was a man with a solid reputation and a flourishing bakery business. I never thought about him doing something illegal. He was a perfect dad, but right now, doubts clouded my head. I walked downstairs with imaginations in my head, hoping to get some answers from my mom. I walked in on her crying with a glass of wine in her hand, probably to help with the feelings she was going through. I called out to her gently, hoping my voice would provide comfort to her. Tanya, I'm sorry, but I didn't know it was going to get to this. We had everything planned. Just one mistake and everything came crashing down. They're coming for me. I know it. I can feel it, she said before bursting into tears again. I was more confused. Dad was not the only one that was in trouble. Mom was included. They had their money. They were billionaires, one of the richest couples in the city. Every nook and corner of the city knew about the Bells family and how nice they were. On top of that, Dad was a natural philanthropist, helping those in need with no conditions attached, and Mom always backed him up, pushing him to be better. As their child, I enjoyed the benefits that came with this. I never lacked anything. Whatever I wanted was always provided for me. My schoolmates respected me because of my parents. I asked her what she meant with a confused look on my face. I don't know how you'd take it. You'd probably hate your dad. I'm sorry, Tanya, she said. Mom, cut the crap and get to the story or the history of whatever you did. The police were outside our house and she was acting so dramatic. It's just crazy how wanting to be a rich human who can afford whatever he or she wants pushes you to do crazy things, she said. I don't know if I was supposed to be annoyed or patient, but I stood still as I waited for her to continue. Your father and I are not what we seem like. Mom, you are driving me crazy. Will you get to the point, I asked. In the disguise of bakers, we run a hidden organization where we deliver drugs of all kinds to the premium clients. But, but we own a chain of bakeries, right? I asked, confusion evident in my voice. She only looked at me, embarrassment plastered on her face. She ought to be. She was an embarrassment right now, and that was the only word to define it. My dad walked back in, looking at my mom with shock in his eyes. I guess he didn't want me to be aware of their deeds. I asked my dad if it was true, but he just stood there staring at my mother. How could you? I yelled. Just for the sake of some money? How could you stoop so low? I just couldn't wipe the disgust off my face. Some money? My mom shouted back. Look all around you, Tanya. Such a life of luxury and comfort doesn't come by selling cakes. Your father and I worked our butts off to give you the life we could only dream of when we were your age. So you better watch your words or I'll rip out that sharp tongue of yours. And it's not just us, all the people who work for us. We've made them a fortune. So you know what you're doing is actually wrong? It's not just about the money you earn or the money those girls and boys get from it, I said with tears at the edge of my eyes. I told him that the money earned with dignity was the best and walked out on them. I walked back to my room. My own parents, my dad, I trusted him more than that. He was the sweetest person, a philanthropist. I was almost in my room when I heard the high-pitched sound again. The cops entered our house. I just stood in front of my bedroom, numb, not knowing if I was supposed to feel sorry for my parents. Tanya, my dad's voice rang through the house. I used to be the one who jumped out of joy when I heard his voice, but this time, I couldn't help but be overcome by mixed emotions when I heard him say that. He walked up to me, his eyes swollen, probably from tears. He was an emotional person. He begged me to answer him. 
I don't know what you want me to say or do, to hug you after hearing what you did and how you became a billionaire. Why are you even here? You ought to rot in prison. That's what people who do what you did deserve. Sweetheart, I know that right now you're going through hundreds of emotions, but I can tell you that what your mom said wasn't the truth. He said, holding out his hands to hold me, but I only moved further. And what makes you think I would believe you? I asked. Because I was an honest, simple baker. What I did, I didn't have an option. For the first time, I really looked into his eyes to tell if he was telling the truth or lying. But I couldn't tell. He explained to me that mother was never satisfied with her life. She always yearned for more. And to do that, she was willing to go to any length. She told me you guys did everything together, I said, walking towards him. I trusted him. And to have heard he did something like that just broke me into pieces. With the little hope I had left in me, I walked towards him, hoping it was really the truth that he was serving me. She's not what she pretends to be, and I never wanted her dark side to be revealed to you. After all, she is your mother, he said. My father told me that all their wealth would be confiscated and the house would be taken away from them. He gave me the details to a trust fund he had set up for me. He said it would be sufficient to take me through college. I hugged him and closed my eyes, hoping that it was all just a nightmare. But then, as my eyes opened, I watched in horror as the police forced their way in and restrained my father and mother. Tears streamed down my face. I wanted to yell. I wanted to tell them my dad was innocent, that he was forced into all this. But as I looked at him, I saw resignation in his eyes. He was prepared to face whatever would happen. And just like that, he was gone.